Psalm 10. And we see the psalmist dealing with one of the difficult circumstances that the child of God faces in this sin-stained world in which we live. Evil seems to be triumphing and nothing seems to be happening to the wicked or the evil who are doing their wicked, evil things. And if that's the case, how do we square that with the fact that God is king? Remember we noted that one thing different with this psalm compared to the previous psalms that we've looked at so far. This psalm is unlike Psalm 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, not 8, it's 8 was a different thing, and 9. In, in other words, every psalm that we've looked at, except for Psalm 1 and Psalm 8, every psalm that we've looked at so far, has always had the psalmist speaking of me and my and rescue me and help me. And that's good and that's great. But we, we know this is a little different. It's not the psalmist in a situation where he's necessarily experiencing this. We've seen that in some of the other psalms. But he is looking out on the world and seeing these kind of things happening. And the psalmist obviously is a man of great faith and the Holy Spirit's working inside him and he's even writing exactly what God would have him to write. But he's looking at the world and he's seeing this. And the question, the theme of this psalm is just in verse 1 of Psalm 10. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? I see these things and I know what your word says about you and... How, how does this all work out? Why? As is sometimes the case, we don't get a direct answer to the question in the psalm or elsewhere in scripture where these kind of questions are raised. Uh, I take it a basic outline of this psalm is this. We, we noted this two weeks ago. But the question is raised, why don't you act to help the godly afflicted? Verse 1. That's kind of the theme of the psalm. Secondly, in an outline of this psalm, uh, the trouble is illustrated. He talks about uh, why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? That's verse 1. Here, the trouble that he's talking about is illustrated. Wicked men, he's going to describe them, wicked men are pursuing the poor. They're doing really wicked things to the poor. Verses 2 through 11. So this is the problem. This is what he's seeing. This is happening in the world that the psalmist is aware of. And I think we could say in our world today as well, you, you see these things. We're aware of these things. That's verses 2 through 11. Third, we see the answer in time of trouble is given. So this is the time of trouble. He's saying, why, O oh Lord, is, is this happening? And then third, we see the answer to this basic theme given. It's not an answer to the why question. It is an answer to the trouble that he's seeing. And I, I'm describing things too much to even writing this down. If you're trying to write down, what's his outline? Now, this is like a paragraph. Uh, third, this is the outline part. The answer in time of trouble is given. Here it is. Trust in me and pray, trust in and pray to the God who sees and knows and has power to bring justice. That's verses 12 through 18. Although the why question, why, O oh Lord, do you stand far away? That's not given a because answer in this psalm. The answer, when we see those kind of things, is still the same. Turn to the Lord, trust in the Lord, uh, call upon the Lord to bring justice. That's how we see the, the psalmist respond in this situation. He doesn't bring out the answer, why is this happening? But he does give an answer to, when you see this happening, what's something you can do? Turn to the Lord. Trust in the Lord, call upon the Lord uh, for help here. 
First part of the outline, we looked at this two weeks ago. The question is raised, why don't you act to help the godly afflicted? This is verse 1. Look down there again to verse 1 of Psalm 10. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Uh, Certainly this is figurative language. We know that God never can hide himself, literally. He's everywhere, and he's, he's not like standing outside and not inside or something like that. He's everywhere present. That's one of his characteristics, his attributes. But in this poetic language where the psalmist is, uh, what, what the psalmist is getting at, it, it seems to be uh, this all-powerful God who the psalmist knows and who he trusts in, when, when he says, why do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself? What he's getting at when he says that is God's acting like someone who doesn't care. Like a spectator kind of watching and, huh, well, I see all this happening, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Uh, someone who just doesn't feel like helping. That's what it's, that, that figurative language of standing far away or hiding yourself. That's kind of what that's getting at. Uh, that's, that's not the case. But it, it seems like that. The question the psalmist wrestles with is why. Uh, two weeks ago when we were in the Psalms, I think it was two weeks ago, we noted an answer is given to this in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Uh, I'm not going to go over that thoroughly again tonight. But what is given here is a description of the wicked uh, that the psalmist is seeing doing these wicked things and there's trouble and whatnot, but then there's a recalling of truth about God to trust in so that we can call upon him. Uh, so, verse 1, why, O Lord, why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Second part of the outline, now this trouble is illustrated that he's talking about when he says, why, why are you hiding yourself? The trouble is this, that there are wicked men who are pursuing the poor. That's in verses 2 through 11. Look at verse 2. In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. This is what's so disturbing to the psalmist. This is what he's seeing happening. This is, uh, of course, none of us want to see this kind of thing, but especially when you know what the Lord is like and his power and his ability and who he is as God, to see this happening is... Why? Why? Skip down to verse 8. We see the nature of the wicked's pursuit of the poor. This isn't just like trying to rip them off a little bit. Verse 8. This is in this section describing the wicked. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless he lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. So this is the, the pursuit of the poor that we're talking about. It literally involves killing them, murder, uh, just you know, the, these are hard things to even think about, I, I think, as, as believers. But uh, part of the wickedness, there, there's something in them that likes to hurt and destroy and express power and even kill someone. It's not even bringing out necessarily that they're trying to rob them. But, yeah, we're, we're just going to do this. This is part of the wicked. This is what raises the question in the psalmist's mind. Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far away? It's hard to see these kind of things and also affirm what we saw in Psalm 9, maybe three weeks ago. Uh, look over to Psalm 9, verse 7. Psalm 9, verse 7. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. And he judges the world, not will judge, right now. He judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. So the psalmist knows that's true, as well as what he sees happening in the world. He can't deny what, what's out there, and the wicked are doing these kind of things. So back in verse 2 again, he 
quickly sends up a prayer. This isn't the heart of this section, but he does offer up a quick prayer here in verse 2. Look at Psalm 10, verse 2. He says, start of the verse, in arrogance the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Here's the gist of what we'll see developed later in the psalm. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. Okay, this is what the wicked are like. They're, they're pursuing the poor. They're doing these wicked things, these evil things. Well, let them be caught. God, you do something about this. Again, we'll see this developed a lot more at the end of the psalm. But even right here, he's re he, he knows who God is, and he knows to call upon the Lord. And we just see this right off the bat in verse 2. One of the primary reasons that we saw a couple weeks ago for why God, even though he is the just judge of the universe, even right now, and he is king of this world, and, and why the scripture would answer, why does it seem like the Lord is standing far off? Or why isn't he acting right here and right now always and letting wickedness go like that? Uh, one of the answers we said two weeks ago is from Ecclesiastes 3 verse 18, which says, I said in my heart, with regard to the children of man, that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. We noted then, and, and you all know this, people aren't beasts. Men are created in God's image. You know, we're, we're different than all the animals. We're, we're image bearers of God. But what we saw last time we were together is... I take it what that Ecclesiastes is saying. If man is going to take God out of the picture, in other words, living as if there is no God, living as if everything that matters, everything that uh, is significant is just what I can see with my eyes, I can taste, I can touch, just all, in the words of Ecclesiastes, everything under the sun, if that's all there is, God is testing uh, men so that they can see if this is really how things are. They're not, but okay, this is what you're living like. There is, there's nothing else beyond this. If this is really how things are, if this is really how you believe life in this world is, then you're just beasts. This is one of the primary characteristics of the wicked that are described in these verses. They're acting in beast-like ways. You can't hardly imagine a person who'd be thinking, I'm just going to go out and crush someone. Uh, I'm going to catch someone and just kill this innocent person. I don't have anything against them. I'm just going to do it. That, that's, that's a beast-like attitude. Look down to verse 3. We see in verse 3 and verse 4 that like in Ecclesiastes if you take God totally out of the picture, God, God's going to test you to see, here's what you're like. You're, you're like a beast. This is what the wicked are doing. They're taking God out of the picture, and that's why they're acting this way. Look at verse 3. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him, all his thoughts are, there is no God. This is what Ecclesiastes was getting at. Why God would test, why some of these things happen? God tests men to see that they are but beasts, if, if they're taking him out of the picture. This is exactly how the wicked is act, acting. There is no God. The thing that here stings the most for the psalmist probably for any of us, when we see someone with this kind of attitude, there is no God. I don't believe any of that stuff. Uh, when we see someone with that kind of attitude, obviously the wickedness, the murder, that's really bad. But also, when we see how they're living in verse 5 and 6, look, Psalm 10, verses 5 and 6, his ways prosper at all times. Wow, here's a guy saying there's no God. Here's this wicked person. He's doing all these wicked things. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. 
this, this is the outflow of the proud and arrogant heart described earlier. Uh, there's no God. Nothing's going to touch me. I can do what I want, and nothing will happen to me. This is just that characteristic. I shall not be moved. Jesus once said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So now we see the mouth of the wicked developed in the following verses in this description of the wicked and their actions. Verse 7. And even with the mouth, it's destructive. It's not just with the actions and trying to kill people. That's much worse. But even the mouth is, is used for destructive purposes. Uh, I, I think of Proverbs 11, I believe is verse 24, where it says, with his mouth, the ungodly destroys his neighbor. That's kind of what we see here. Uh, verse 7. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. So that's, that's part of the mouth. It's overflowing from this proud, wicked heart. He, even with his tongue, he's trying to destroy people. Verse 8, we, we looked at these verses briefly. I'll just read through these again. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. You know, again, this gets back to that beast-like character. You, you can picture and we'll see it here in a moment. But, but a lion, they don't look for the strong to go after. They look for the weak and the helpless. If, if there's some herd of some kind of animal where there's the little uh, helpless animals, well, that's who you're going to go after. The, this is the beast-like character of the wicked. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. End of verse 8. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. Beast-like character. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. When there's not a strong uh, governmental justice system, which I assume... In Israel at the time that the psalmist is writing this, there must not have been. When things begin to fall apart, uh, it, it's like the law of the jungle. The strong take the weak and the helpless. But behind all that is that attitude. People in general aren't going to do that. But behind that, if that's happening, uh, is when you take God out of the picture. Verse 11, God has forgotten he has hidden his face. He will never see it. You know, law isn't going to touch me. I, I'm strong. Maybe I'm stronger than the law. Maybe there is no law. Uh, I can do what I want. God's not, God's not there. I don't believe in him. He's not going to do anything about it because he's not real. I'll do what I want. When we look at this psalm and we think to... Uh, 21st century world in which we live in we think well what about now certainly in the world there is this kind of evil going on in the world as well one of the great evils of communism has been to seek to take God out of the picture as a governmental system I think in those kind of systems, when you are intentionally taking God out of the picture, that is the worst element. Because if you're promoting that, if you're taking God out of the system, what are you left with? I can do what I want if I'm powerful enough to do it. If I'm not caught, so what? I'll just do what I want. My uh, kids are reading right now, uh, George Orwell's classic dystopian book, 1984. And uh, I've kind of been reading it again. I, I, I think I read 1984 and 1984, just for your information. But in that book, we see this delight in power for the sake of power and crushing the helpless just for the sake of doing it that Orwell, if you know much about that book, he, he experienced, he was part of some of the communist, socialist 
kind of things. He, he thought it was a good thing at first, and then he got involved with it, and he saw where it all led, and then he wrote books like Animal Farm in 1984. But in the end of this book, and it just gets really uh, not pleasant reading, but I want my kids to read it anyhow, uh, Winston is being tortured. He's the main character. O'Brien is the one doing it. He's this high governmental leader who Winston thought was going to be a good guy. But O'Brien gives this lengthy speech of kind of propaganda to Winston. At, at the end of the speech, he says, uh, here, here's the world we're looking for. And, and this would just be the perspective. If there is no God, and if it's just about power, then here we go. He says, there will be no curiosity, no enjoyment of the process of life. All competing pleasures will be destroyed. But always, do not forget this, Winston, always there will be the intoxication of power, constantly increasing and constantly growing subtler. Always, at every moment, there will be the thrill of victory, the sensation of trampling on an enemy who is helpless. Think of this psalm and how the wicked like to trample, crush under their foot the helpless. And then this classic line from the book, if you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. And that's just godlessness. You know, if, if God's not on the scene, if all there is is power, then hey, let's be powerful. Let's enjoy stamping on people and crushing them and doing this kind of thing. That is the wicked. And that is the beast-like character of man when and if God is totally taken out of the picture. And he talks about this O'Brien in the, in the book. It's, obviously, it's a fiction book. But uh, if, if you want to read his full speech, it brings out this very psalm unintentionally, I think. I don't think Orwell is even Christian. But it, it sure brings out this, the wickedness of just, here, here's our joy, crushing people. That's what we'll find joy in. Uh, so what do we do in a world in which we see this kind of thing? In what follows, the psalmist, in a sense, continues to trust in the Lord. Uh, not just in a sense. He does. A good summary of what we've seen so far and what we will see from, uh, in, in the remainder of this psalm tonight is the uh, line from the old hymn, This is my Father's World. The third stanza says, This is my Father's World. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though, though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. And that's what we see really, if you could summarize the last portion of this psalm, that's what we see. Yeah, it seems strong and the wicked are out there and they're doing their wicked things. And it seems like that's happening, but God is the ruler yet. That's what we come back to by faith. Look to uh, verse uh, the, well, the third portion of our outline tonight, the answer in time of trouble is given. When you see these kind of things, here's the answer. Trust in and pray to the God who sees, knows, and has power to bring justice. Verses 12 through 18. Here's the psalmist's call to God in prayer. Uh, even despite what he's saying, in faith, the psalmist says this in verse 12. Arise, O Lord. Stop with that, that, that phrase, arise, O Lord. That, that's great. This wording, arise, O Lord. This, this is the wording. It's, it's a prayer here. But it's the opening words of the ancient marching song of the tribes of Israel. Each time the Israelites uh, would break and move camp as they marched from Egypt to the promised land and the ark set out before them, here's the words that they would say. For the sake of time, I won't have you turn back here, but Numbers 10, verse 35, it says this. And whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. So here, in verse 12, the psalmist is recalling those words. Arise, O Lord. This is a call for God. It's a prayer to God to take decisive action in what is taking place in this world. 
Arise, O Lord, help, act, fight against the wicked, for the helpless, the defenseless. Verse 12, continuing on. O God, lift up your hand. This is a figurative way for asking God to demonstrate his strength. And especially in the area that this psalm is all concerned about. Forget not the afflicted. There are these people out there and they're helpless and they're weak. And, and the wicked are trying to hurt them just because they're helpless and weak. Forget, forget not the afflicted. Arise, help them. Verse 13. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? This is what we've already seen, the, the comments of the wicked in this previous portion of the psalm. Uh, that's what their thought process is, but it's not true. Verse 14, that's what the wicked think. Verse 14, but you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. You know, that's the, the prime example, I guess, in the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament. Uh, the widows and the orphans. These are the most helpless people in an ancient society, and probably today as well. You have been, Lord, the helper of the fatherless. Verse 15. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. This is how he's, I guess you could say, asking God to take action. When there's the wicked who are doing these things to the afflicted and the poor, and he sees this, and he's calling upon God to act. Well, do something powerful. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Stop what they're doing. Do what it takes to stop it. End of verse 15 where it says, Call his wickedness to account till you find none. I think part of this psalm, and especially right here, is indicating uh, a, a prayer, a hope, a look forward to the day when God's kingdom is fully on this earth and evil will be dealt with immediately. It's almost as if he's looking for it and calling for that day. In the New Testament, we would say Jesus' phrase, thy kingdom come. That's almost like what he's asking here in this verse. Call his wickedness to account till you find none, till in this world just you're dealing with wickedness immediately. Uh, we know that from New Testament revelation that Jesus is the king and that Jesus someday will return to rule and reign on this earth. And when he does, it will be wickedness won't go on like this. It will immediately be handled. And it's almost like the psalmist is looking forward to that kind of day when he says this of call his wickedness to account. The wicked people, the wicked one, till you find none. Verse 16. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. Uh, that's true of the Lord in the sense of his universal kingdom. Even right now, God is providentially ruling over everything. Uh, sovereignly, he's ruling over all things. Even when people don't acknowledge it, acknowledge it he's still ruling. He's still moving. Uh, but he will also someday be visibly, powerfully ruling on this earth where the wicked will be dealt with in ways not like in this current sin-stained world. Again, with further revelation, we see this will be fulfilled when Jesus returns to this earth to rule and reign in the millennium. But again, right now, uh, verse 17, this statement of faith. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. I take it as the psalmist closes this psalm. He starts, why are you standing so far off? Why, why don't you help here? He, he closes with this statement of strong faith. You will do these things. You, you will incline your ear to do justice to the phallus and the oppressed. So that the wicked who are out there, the man of the earth, uh, 
there will be a day when these things will be no more. The psalmist clings to this truth about God and longs for the day when God's kingdom will be here on this earth visibly in the sense of, again, I, I take it the psalmist probably didn't have the understanding of the future coming kingdom that we did, but there's a knowledge that there will be a day coming when the Messiah would be here. Uh, this truth is what we cling to, trust in, pray in light of in this sin-stained world that we see. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these truths. We thank you that you are a great king forever and ever. Right now, that is you. When there's wickedness and when there is uh, the kind of things described in this psalm happening to the helpless and the poor and the afflicted, we ask even now that you would arise and act and uh, stop the wicked from those kind of things. That's the psalmist's call. That's our call. We know you're powerful. We know you can do it. We know you are the judge. So we call upon you to act. We also know that fully these things will happen. These prayers will be answered when your son Jesus comes back to rule and reign on this earth. So as we close our time together tonight, we also say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We, we long for that day. Please come, Lord Jesus. We say these things in your name. Amen.